and we're live. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to yet another session of Facebook Live with uh, the Team Sharezai. We're so happy that you can join us today. So today we have a very interesting topic to talk about, sleep. Now, we're actually going to have multiple discussions and talk about the importance of sleep. We've learned a lot in the last couple of years about the importance of sleep as far as brain health is concerned and particularly in the prevention of Alzheimer's disease. And you know, being physicians and always thinking about lack of sleep being one of the major issues that most of us have is becoming more and more a topic that everybody wants to discuss at scientific meetings and um, journals. So today we're actually going to talk about a particular paper. Yeah, we've lost a lot of sleep just thinking about this concept of sleep. <laughs> I, I, I was thinking a lot about that joke, but I, I hope it went across well. Nonetheless, uh, this is an important topic. It's becoming known that we're realizing that sleep is one of the most important aspects of brain health in particular, health in general, but brain health in particular. Absolutely. So, um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to discuss um, one, uh, one of the latest papers that actually came out. Um, it was published by a team of scientists in Italy and they basically showed the importance of sleep and the lack thereof in the human brain. So in the brain, we have certain cells that are the supporting structure, yeah. essentially like the glue of the brain. And glia. these, the glia cells, the glial cells and mic or microglia. Yeah. So these cells are responsible for keeping the brain clean and getting rid of the normal byproducts that are a result of wear and tear. Uh, they actually constitute 90% of cellular structure in the brain. Mm -hmm. And we're realizing that they're more than just for clearing. They now realize that they're also part of memory uh, processes as well. So mm -hmm. their function is becoming better known. But the focus today, or this paper was on, the title was, if you don't get sleep, your brain literally eats itself out. Yeah. Uh, so that was shocking to everybody. So we wanted to uh, share that with you. So these microglia, basically, like I said earlier, they get rid of uh, the byproducts or you know the 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 normal uh, products that are left out and they need to be uh, cleared away. But when they compared brains that have slept well compared to brains that have not slept well, these microglia kind of go crazy in the brains that haven't slept mm -hmm. very well, which basically means that they get rid of a whole lot more um, unnecessarily. It's like when you hire somebody to come and help you clean the house, they may clean the house, but if you haven't slept, they might get rid of the carpet, the furniture, maybe your family dog. So it, it just really, really damaged the brain. And you know, just like the statement says, it eats itself out. And so yeah. this shows, and along with other um, research projects that have been done in the recent past that sleep is very, very important. As a matter of fact, the whole purpose of sleep is, is actually to preserve the brain, to sharpen the brain and to help us function better. In fact, uh, uh, if, if sleep is purported to have evolved with the brain, uh, the, the most important aspect of sleep is to keep the brain healthy. We'll talk about this a little bit later from one of the questions that came to us. But uh, that's why we think that this paper was significant. Now, the microglia, uh, so we always talk about, you know, uh, the, the restorative capacity of sleep. We've spoken in other sessions as well. Uh, but the microglia have this capacity every night to the axons, even the connections of memory mm -hmm. that are faulty, it actually gets rid of it. Yeah. It gets rid of connections, literally connections. But sometimes it actually goes awry and gets rid of good connections. When does that happen? when you don't get good sleep. You actually lose brain volume, of course, in small amounts, but over time and, 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 and large quantities, it, it accumulates to significant damage to the brain. This is one study that needs to be reproduced and validated, but still quite interesting. Absolutely. And you know, some of the other function of sleep is also to uh, basically um, put, uh, put memories and put the information that we acquire on a daily basis into the correct areas of the brain, essentially organize it into a file and cabinet system. Correct, yeah. correct. Uh, before we go on, if you have any questions, please share it with us. We have some questions that have been sent to us already, so we yes. can work on that. But in the meantime, if you have any other questions, be it about sleep or other aspects of the brain, we're, we're, we're open to it. 
We can actually start by addressing one of the questions that um, somebody sent us um, on Facebook. And, uh, you know, she was basically saying that um, is fixing the sleep disorder um, prevent Alzheimer's disease? Does just addressing the sleep disorder get rid of Alzheimer's disease? And, you know, the simple answer is no. Um, prevention of Alzheimer's disease requires a more comprehensive approach, which basically means it's not one disorder, it's not one sleep pattern uh, problems, it's not only nutrition, it's not only physical activity, it's all of them together. We've said this in our book. Uh, 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 when you look at our book, it's coming in September. When you read the book, we, we, we're not saying that we're curing Alzheimer's. There are people that actually say that that once you have developed Alzheimer's, you can cure it. There's no evidence to that. We will, uh, we would, that would be irresponsible of us to say that. We're saying that if you're at risk and, and you have certain risk factors, and a great majority of people who do have risk factors, if they take on a comprehensive approach to prevention, mm -hmm. which very few populations do, and where we were, and, and Loma Linda, and, uh, uh, the, there are populations uh, that actually take on this comprehensive approach, uh, that you can actually prevent the disease within normal lifespan, within 78 years of age, that, that's what we're saying. And this is actually not very controversial when you look at it in that context. That, and, and only for 90%, those who have uh, pre senlin one pre senlin 2 and APP and other genes, no, that, that's not going to happen. But for the greater 90%, if you take on a comprehensive approach early on, you can uh, avoid it. And even later in life, even when you have mild cognitive impairment or uh, some early Alzheimer's, you can affect the disease. You can affect the disease significantly. That's important. That's hope. And that's not false hope. That's actually data-driven. There's nothing we're saying in many ways that's different. There are many papers that have shown diet works early on, exercise works early on. Amazing numbers and reproduced numbers. We're actually saying that when you look at this comprehensively in populations that we were, you see remarkable responses. and. And, and, and we say it very responsibly to this point, up to the age 78 to 80. So that's critical to give that hope, not false hope. And sleep by itself is not gonna do it. Mm -hmm. um, it's restorative sleep plus a whole slew of other things together that will actually give you more and more uh, success. Now, what you did in your paper in Stroke, um, or showed that with, with just diet, yeah. that it's not all or none, it's not binary. Absolutely, and that, I believe that that's one of the best news that people can can get. Um, you know, a lot of us, when we talk about a healthy lifestyle, most of us feel like either I stick to a very healthy lifestyle or I'm not going to benefit from it at all. Um, quite the opposite. We've actually seen that by making small incremental changes, um, statistically speaking, the chances of cognitive impairment, stroke, or other brain diseases actually go down. So even if it's like an addition of a small um, uh, good lifestyle uh, habit uh, makes actually a very a big difference. And this is important. It's almost like magical thinking that all the other chronic diseases of aging have a lifestyle component, but all of a sudden Alzheimer's is magically a one-hit disease like Huntington's. It's not. We've known this. It's a cumulative disease overlaying a genetic risk profile mm -hmm. that gives you a whole range. So you have these multiple genes. And a disease like Huntington's, it's one gene chromosome four, your father has it, the son will get it at a certain age. We now already have identified nearly 30 or more genes involved in vascular versus immune versus other components. And so it's multi-gene, which gives you a range and your lifestyle determines where you fall in that. Yet, none of that narrative is talked about in the, in the community. All it is is Aricept and Namenda, and you have the disease, that's it. It's about educating communities that if you do X, Y, and Z, even if it's not perfect lifestyle change, that you will have some effect, some control over your brain health. Mm -hmm. Other than that, it's just magical thinking and just stepping back and waiting. Um, we do understand that there are a, a percentage of the pot, where we say about 10%, 5 to 10%, that have strong genetic risks, yes. that even with lifestyle, you have very little latitude. But for a great majority, you can do quite a bit. Sleep is just one of many components. Absolutely. Significant and, though, sorry. And one of the other important things that we discuss in our book is that these lifestyle changes need to be implemented very early. Yes. That, you know, a lot of us think that Alzheimer's disease is a disease that starts 
occurring in our 50s or 60s or 70s or even later. But now we know that the changes in the brain, the pathological changes in the brain actually start as early as in our 40s and 50s. I mean, this is not a scary thing. What we're trying to say is that given that we have all this data, this is more of an empowerment session for all of us to know, okay, there's a lot of things that we can do earlier on to make sure that our risk is lowered later yeah, on as well. Absolutely. So let's go to the other question that we got. Um, somebody actually sent us a question about sleep apnea. So this gentleman has sleep apnea and he was wondering, what is the significance of sleep apnea on Alzheimer's disease yeah. and that was a great question so for those of us that are not very familiar with sleep apnea it's basically a sleep disorder where uh, you hold your breath uh, whether it's for seconds even up to a minute multiple times during the night and it can be either central which means there's you know a signal problem uh, from the brain that is not really connecting very well or a peripheral problem which means sometimes Struck. we actually have um, uh, you know um, obstruction. Uh, obstruction in our in our fairing or, or other reasons. So sleep apnea has been studied and we know that if the brain doesn't get oxygen for some period of time, the damage is immense. Correct. Um, not only structurally, but also to the blood vessels. And that's why it's very important to detect um, sleep apnea very early Correct. on. And CPAP machine is the answer. Yeah, I, I mean, it's not just a risk as far as Alzheimer's is concerned. It's risk for stroke risk, significantly yes. higher. Absolutely. Ha risk of heart attack, significantly higher. And it's a very underdiagnosed disease. It sure is, yeah. And and it's and it's uh, reversible. It's treatable. Now the treatment is uh, is not easy. The mm -hmm. CPAP machine or the, the other devices are not easy to get used to. But I tell people the alternative is worse. Every night that you have sleep apnea and you're not getting uh, restful sleep and you're not getting oxygen uh, to your brain, you're damaging uh, your brain. So that's why it's so important that we get appropriate uh, uh, treatment for sleep apnea. First of all, most importantly, to get identification of the uh, disease. One important thing, it's not just breath holding. So if you're sleeping eight hours or nine hours and the next day you're still tired and fatigued, that should be studied to find, uh, you know, to find out if it's sleep apnea. If you're snoring a lot, uh, not every snoring means uh, uh, sleep apnea, but it should be evaluated. If you're, and of course, if uh, your partner sees that you're holding your breath in the middle of the night, definitely should be evaluated. So that's why sleep apnea is a condition that should be studied and, and, and its effect on brain is significant. Not just Alzheimer's, all chronic diseases of aging, brain, especially when it, as it pertains to brain, but even heart and stroke and everything else as well. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, you and I have. So I'm, I'm glad that somebody actually asked that question. So the third question is pretty interesting. Um, somebody asked us, do all animals sleep? Yeah, that, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cute one, interesting one. Uh, um, so we believe, as, as far as we know, uh, sleep has evolved with, with the brain or even earlier brains called ganglia or these nerve groupings. Um, um, and uh, almost all animals uh, the sleep to, uh, to one way or another. Some animals that you would, uh, especially uh, mammals, uh, you would expect uh, the mammals that are in water have some really interesting sleep patterns. For example, dolphins are mammals. They have to breathe. So if they sleep, they're going to sink mm -hmm. so, uh, and, and die. So what that happens, part of the brain stays uh, awake and the other part stays semi-awake and they, they go in circles and uh, go up and down and get, get air. Um, and, uh, and other animals in sleep in uh, short bursts, but still they do sleep. And even small animals like flies and others have been known to uh, are known to sleep, and sleep it seems to be a function and purpose uh, that serves the brain, because this amazing organ I, you're going to hear this over and over. <laughs> uh, this brain, three pounds, two percent of the body, consumes twenty five percent of the energy and oxygen. It it do, never rests. The, the statement that we only use ten percent of our brain. Uh, the person that says that is probably using 10%, no, nobody gets offended. But, but it, it, we're always using the brain, um, maybe not efficiently, but we're always using the brain, even at night. And it over, it's, a, it's an incredibly overwhelmed system. So it needs rest, it needs clearing much better than any part, other part of the brain uh, body, and it, and it needs a time to reorganize the brain. So the two functions that we say that the brain serves is, one is 
detoxing, yes. getting rid of bad uh, chemicals that have uh, accumulated, byproducts that have accumulated, bad connections that have accumulated gets rid of that. The second part is consolidation of memory and thought. Mm -hmm. That's why the dreaming, you're all these thoughts. I, I give the example of, uh, if anybody's a computer uh, geek, defragging. Um, We're kind of aging ourselves when we talk about defragging. I think know? so. <laughs> I think so. Nobody defrags anymore. Uh, I, I, so, I mean, yeah. So uh, it, it's, uh, the, the computer puts the uh, uh, folders in the right places. And that's the same thing with, uh, with, with dreaming. You're not predicting the future. I've heard people in parties come to me, said, you know, I dreamt this thing and then the next thing happened the next uh, night, the day or the next week. No, uh, you're just defragging. Uh, it's not that uh, romantic. But nonetheless, <laughs> it is an incredible important part. It is. It's cleansing the body. Uh, we, we said it in a previous talk. They've done studies that looked at amyloid levels, which is a bad protein that builds up in the brain. People who have good sleep their amyloid levels go down, and those who have bad sleep, it goes up. Same thing with other inflammatory byproducts. Absolutely. So sleep becomes important, we're becoming more aware of it, and we're studying it better. Mm -hmm. We don't have perfect data, not even close yet. Uh, we're looking at the study, uh, uh, effect of people who have these unusual work patterns, yes. you know, shifting from morning to night, morning to night. Nurses or, you know, what they call a graveyard shift. And they've Correct. studied those populations to see, you know, what happens to people who don't get sleep or their circadian rhythm is actually affected. And the results are pretty interesting. Correct, correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, on, on, and short term, they've done studies on, on uh, your ability to think and focus and memorize. Yes. Uh, the, the, the taking tests in the morning after a night of lack of, with lack of sleep. We all knew that you didn't do as well, but it's significantly poor. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you as, and as far as remembering things for the next day, people who don't get sleep, they're not able to consolidate that memory into long-term memory, so it actually doesn't stick with that. And it not, this is not necessarily only an adult, they've actually done research on kids and young adults too, and they have had significant problems remembering things or their scores were lower when they didn't sleep, exactly. which kind of supports the, um, the concept of uh, defragging and memory consolidation during sleep. Correct. And in our book, we've actually talked about um, sleep. It's essentially a chapter and we talk about the importance of good sleep and what that means because you know good sleep may mean different things for different people yeah. and how to incorporate sleep hygiene or a good sleeping habit in your life given your resources what works for you um so so check it out when you can yeah it's it's it, there's a lot you can do to improve your sleep besides just medications uh, many of the medications have a uh, side effect mm -hmm. Uh, and many of them, you, you feel like you had good night's sleep, you're knocked out. But as far as the cycles of sleep, which we'll talk again uh, in another session, uh, the, you know, the four phases plus the uh, REM sleep, you don't get good uh, cycles. So therefore, um, uh, you, you can damage the brain. Sorry about our dog barking inside. I think he didn't get <laughs> yeah. good sleep last night. But nonetheless, I think it's, uh, it's important to talk about. Uh, and in one session, we actually wanted to show what a good sleep room looks like. Yes. A bedroom that's actually optimized for good sleep. Mm -hmm. There are about 17 to 18 to 20, it depends on what you, uh, elements that you can change in your bedroom that gives you optimal sleep. The most important thing you can do, one of the most important things you can do for your brain. Yes. So we will talk about that in another session. And especially because we spend about one third of our life sleeping, it better be something that you know requires a lot of attention. Correct. Well, I think that's it for today. We've addressed um, all the questions that we got. Um, stay tuned. We will get back to you next week with another Facebook Live session. Please, if you have any questions or if you ha think Topics. that there is a topic that is of interest to you that hasn't been discussed already, and I'm pretty sure there are a lot of uh, topics, we would be happy to take them on and, and talk about it. And uh, post your questions for us. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, go to our website, teamsharesi.com, and check out our book. You can actually get it from any bookstore. It's for pre-order. And all the profits go to charity for the communities for their brain health. Exactly. All the profits go to an initiative where um, you know we're basically um, creating brain health workshops for um, the communities and um, you can pre-order the book and along with it at this point you can also get a nutrition and a recipe packet that we think is awesome yes and it has a lot of foods and recipes that you can use at home
And I had the most important part in that uh, recipe component and you did? films. Yeah, I was what the was taster. It? Yes, it's she was. The, she was job. doing the easy thing, the cooking, and yeah. the, I was the taster. And uh, I wouldn't know if they're good if you hadn't true. tasted that's true. them. That's true. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Have a good day. Bye.